On Law Weekly, we look at resolving disputes in the capital market and then we serve you what the suspended president of the Court of Appeal, Justice Ayo Salami, has been saying about the intrigues that led to his suspension from office. Welcome to Law Weekly on Channels Television. I am Shola Shoyeli. Without much ado, let's briefly do a recap of the top stories from the court and a few of what you may have missed. We begin with the report that most courts across the country have resumed seating after the annual vacation. On Monday, the 23rd of September, the Supreme Court and some other courts will commence formal activities to mark the new legal year. As part of the activities, the swearing-in ceremony for the 17 newly appointed senior advocates of Nigeria will hold at the Supreme Court in Abuja. Mr. Godwin Obla, a foremost private prosecutor for the EFCC, Professor Lawrence Asegwa of the University of Beni, and these days law editor Funke Aboyade, will take the silk alongside 14 others. The swearing-in of the 17 senior advocates will bring to 388 the total number of those privileged to be admitted to the inner bar since its inception in 1975. In Lagos, most of the judges are back at their courts. Last week, however, some lawyers could still be seen trying to locate their case files and the courtrooms for some of their partly heard cases. That's because the chief judge of Lagos, Justice Ayotunde Phillips, on the 10th of August, shortly before the vacation commenced, sent out a circular for the posting of judges to new divisions. In the new posting, which takes effect from September 2013 to September 2016, Justice Atinuke Paye, Justice Babajde Lawala Kapu, and Justice Kudira Jose will now sit in the Criminal Law Division of the Court in Ikeja, alongside Justice Ogunsoya, who retains its present court, chambers, and cases. The General Civil Division of the Court in Ikeja has the Chief Judge, Justice Ayo Phillips, as well as Justice Oludotunade Fokwe Okoje, Justice Tomilayo Okuobi, Justice Adenike Koka, Justice Latifa Tokunu, Justice Adeni Yonigbanjo, and Justice Afis Dabiri. Justice Modukwe Onyabo takes over from Justice Olubumi Oyewole as the Probate Judge in Ikeja, while Justice Latifa Folami and Justice Ganyu Safari will now sit in the Lands Division of the Court, also in Ikeja. At the court in Iboshere, Lagos Island, Justice Oye Wale will sit in the newly constituted Fast Track Commercial Mortgage and Revenue Division of the Court, which also has Justice Okpayemi Oke, Justice Mojisola Dada, Justice Olushala Williams, Justice Olabisi Akinlade, amongst others. The judges are, however, to retain all part head cases from their previous postings. One of the cases that was stalled owing to the new posting of the judges in Lagos is that involving the former managing director of Intercontinental Bank, Mr. Erastos Akinbola. The trial judge, Justice Adeni Onigwanjo, was recently transferred from the criminal division of the court to the general civil division. With his transfer, the chief judge of Lagos State, Justice Ayotunde Phillips, has now reassigned Mr. Akinbola's case file to Justice Babajide Lawa Lakaku. With this move, Justice Lawala Kapo becomes the third judge within the last two years to hear the 47.1 billion naira theft charges preferred by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission (EFCC) against Mr. Akimbola and his associate Bayo Dada. No date has, however, been fixed for the hearing of the case before the new trial judge. One case that, however, did go on is the suit involving the People's Democratic Party (PDP). The old PDP, led by Alaji Bamanga Chuko, asked the Lagos High Court, sitting in Ikeja, to strike out a suit filed by the Alaji Kawu Baraje faction of the party. Alaji Baraje, Dr. Sam Sam Jaja, Prince Olagu Soye Uyilola, and the PDP as plaintiffs had brought an application pursuant to Order 39 of the Lagos High Court, asking the court to restrain the Tuko faction from parading themselves as the members of the national executive of the party. Apart from Alaji Tuko, other defendants named in the suit include the deputy chairman, Prince Uche Sekundus, the woman leader, Mrs. Kema Chikwe, and the publicity secretary, Olisa Metsu. 
In a notice of preliminary objection brought person to Order 2, Rule 4 of the Lagos High Court Civil Procedure Rule 2012, the Tuko faction argued that the suit is not competent because the cause of action, which is the purported removal of the defendants and the election of the plaintiffs, arose in Abuja and not in Lagos. Justice Adefu Wokwe Okoje has adjourned till Wednesday, September 25, to allow the Baraje faction to file and serve their response to these objections. In Abuja, the High Court, presided over by Justice Peter Afrin, struck out a suit seeking to determine the authentic winner of the contentious May 25 Nigeria Governor's Forum election. The Governor of Lagos State, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Babatunde Fashola, had dragged to court his colleague from Plato State, Governor Jonah Jang. Governor Fashola had contended that the Governor of River State, Rotimi Amechi, won the May 25 poll, having scored 19 votes to beat Governor Jang, who was said to have polled 16 votes. The suit was, however, struck out after an application for discontinuance brought by the Lagos State Governor. And on the foreign scene, the trial of Saif al Islam Gaddafi, son of slain Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, on charges of undermining state security, resumed last week Thursday in the western city of Zintan. The younger Gaddafi showed up for the short session before the court adjourned the hearings till December 12 to allow other defendants to appear. The trial, which began in January, relates to an alleged attempt by the younger Gaddafi to escape. This with the assistance of a team from the International country. Criminal Court, Great ICC. In June 2012, Oil, Libya detained an ICC delegation on suspicion of smuggling documents and spying gadgets to the younger Gaddafi while visiting him better. in prison. The ICC team members and were later released after a protest from the court. In other legal stories, dispute resolution in the Nigerian capital market is still one issue agitating the minds of lawyers, judges, lawmakers, accountants, stockbrokers, and other members of the capital market community. This girl you're talking about is also your sister. The Capital Market Solicitors Association at this forum, chaired by retired Justice Adeshola Ogmutadi, hosted a vibrant crowd of participants who discussed the jurisdictional issues involving the Federal High Court and the Investment and Securities Tribunal, IST. They dissected the problems and, of course, gave robust and varied solutions. As I today, for those of us that I practice, uh, you still have to make the decision as to which court you, wish, you want to approach. You have an issue of choice of jurisdiction. And recently, in our own firm, uh, we, we, we are dealing with a, a case right now uh, that had to do with um, directors who gave themselves some jumbo bonuses uh, immediately after they raised five billion. I think we need to do a comprehensive rethink of uh, the structure. I think perhaps the, uh, uh, instead of IST coming here to uh, tell us how much they've achieved and all the cases that they've decided, uh, they should recognize that, that this problem is out there and practitioners are facing it. And uh, they should be more proactive in how they engage um, uh, uh, the, the process. And what I mean is how they engage us as practitioners and how they engage the federal high court. One concept they can consider is it, uh, the idea of mutual cooperation uh, between them and the federal high court. Uh, perhaps they can consider some of the concepts that have worked very well in other systems, like uh, you know, uh, setting up a users forum uh, or council, uh, and then there will be uh, some forum where the federal high court judges and the IST. Uh, 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 members meet and then they meet with us as practitioners to discuss how we can either through rulemaking uh, and other schemes um, uh, prevent the what I would call the jurisdictional bleeding that is um, uh, going on. Chief Ilimbe has suggested some administrative uh, solutions and I think in many countries, if I looked at this, if I were in England and someone said, if you have this type of problem, what's the answer likely to be? I think the answer is likely to be administrative or very subsidiary legislation. Someone would come and pass 
some regulations allocating and clarifying jurisdiction between the IST and the Federal High Court. The idea that you have to litigate for 10 or 12 years all the way to the Supreme Court just to be told in which court you should issue your proceeding is a disgrace. And I think it's an indictment on the system that wastes people's time and resources. It may be a game for lawyers, it may be enriching, but it does the system no good or service at all. But unless you also amend the Constitution so as to ensure that these conflicts don't arise, I don't see that the problem is going to go away. I've done uh, a bit of historical research into this, and I realized that what gave rise to the problem is, I'd say with respect, a somewhat cavalier attitude to legislation. And I think this comes out also from what the chairman has said. And I've had cause to say this on various other occasions. I don't see any reason why the legislature would embark on passing a law that has to do with the creation of a court or the judiciary as a whole without involving those who will operate that system. It is when things like that happen that you have these kind of problems. Because it's quite obvious that the things that Chief Hidigwe and Professor Odita have spoken about, about informal fora, uh, the federal high court judges sitting with the IST uh, members to try and resolve areas of conflict, are things that should have taken place before the law was passed, not after the event. I mean, that's why in other advanced democracies, you hear of legislation going through about two years of reviews, white papers, green papers, all sorts of colored papers, before they arrive at what would generally be a consensus. So the, the operators of the system, the judges, the members of the IST would have already identified and addressed these issues before the law was passed. But here, we consistently play catch up and we have these kind of problems. What of the people who have invested their money in the capital market and then are unable, on, on, on the basis of someone's, uh, um, you know, some company's misbehavior on the market or market manipulation, now lack the right to recover the monies that they had invested in the market uh, only because the law is not clear? I think the best way forward would be a constitutional amendment. It will put it to rest. One more final uh, proposition that I want to put forward as a solution is that perhaps we should have a judicial stakeholders meeting where both the judiciary, the Ministry of Justice, as well as the bar will sit down and say to ourselves, what is the correct hierarchy that we should adopt in terms of our courts? Because if we do it, first of all, it will remove the possibility or the need to create further courts and then it will probably allow us to deal with the more um, structural issue, which is the way our courts are presently um, you know, provided with infrastructure and manpower. I don't see why, for instance, we should not have for justices of the Court of Appeal, justices of the Supreme Court, judges of the High Court, a clerking system, whereby judges in the judiciary can have access to the finest legal minds to prefer adequate solutions and reduce their, their workload, allow them to deal with the real issues. There is no doubt that we have serious problems in the country concerning congestion in all the courts and uh, it's indeed comforting to know that uh, the IST has been doing very well in terms of uh, the speed with which that body disposes of the cases. If not for this problem we are having with the um, appeals and the contention prevailing that that uh, body is not suitable to adjudicate at that level, I would have said, I would. why don't you leave them alone? They at least they are doing something. But as it is, they are also creating the bottleneck because of appeals being filed from their decisions to the different uh, appellate courts. Another group of discussants at a session chaired by former Attorney General of the Federation, Chief Bayoju, threw up non-litigation mechanisms for resolving capital market disputes. If the necessary framework is developed uh, for ADR, for capital market issues, once there are issues, you just go that way straight. 
You understand what I'm saying? Either by way of arbitration or by way of mediation. And then whatever decision is arrived at will be binding on the parties. Because if you mediate, at the end of the mediation, you sign a mediation agreement. If you arbitrate, at the end of the day, you'll get an award, which is not appealable. You can only challenge it for misconduct. What we are now going to do is to go through these suggestions and then um, make a distillation out of them. If a company comes out of it, well, all well and good. Otherwise, we should be able to say, look at the opinions. And then we now transmit that to the policymakers to have a look at what the community is saying, the legal community as well as the capital market community is saying. I think the most important thing, uh, message to take home is that people really don't want us to wait year after year until there's an ultimate decision of the Apex Court resolving this matter. We thought that the policymakers can intervene at this period and then find a way to resolve this matter. Uh, a quicker resolution will, will serve the market well because the transaction solicitors are finding it difficult to render opinions to our, the foreign clients who keep asking what are the dispute resolution mechanisms, what, which court has jurisdiction to determine on a capital, on a capital market transaction. Life has just got easier. You stay connected to Channels TV, where news and innovations are shaping our world. Simply log on to ChannelsTV.com to get the breaking news. Browse the homepage according to what matters to you. Tap on the extended coverage of business, sports, politics, lifestyle, infotech, entertainment, health, world news, and lots more. Click on the live link and see the news in real time want to watch the latest video of the day it's just a click away friend us on facebook youtube follow us on twitter google plus participate in channels tv poll and share your comments it's a website you can talk to your voice will be heard channels tv.com the news at your fingertips Welcome back. Staying with the theme of disputes, one dispute that also constantly agitates the minds of some members of the legal profession is that surrounding the suspended president of the Court of Appeal, Justice Ayo Salami. Would we ever truly know what happened? Well, last week Thursday, Justice Salami, who is due to retire from the bench on the 15th of October, spoke about the intrigues that led to his suspension. The occasion was a book launch in his honor by the Lowry branch of the Nigerian Bar Association. The book is titled Nigerian Judiciary Contemporary Issues on Administration of Justice. You are all aware of the call, uh, call log. None of them, not a single one, show that I ever called uh, Tinubu. None of them ever show that I ever called uh, um, Lai Muhammad. The ACN chieftains they were referring to, I never called them. They didn't show any call of that, that I called them. So, we went there, went to the tribunal, we went with witnesses, experts, who are able to show at the NJC that I could, that you could use my phone which is in my pocket, to call somebody. It was demonstrated, we demonstrated it at NJC. You could use my phone, which is in my pocket, to send text message. So all these call logs were fake. That we thank God will uh, we'll survive all the efforts to paint us black. Eventually, they said that uh, the question of perjury. I said, Kasina Alu called me to ask me to dismiss the Sokoto appeal. 
And he said, no, he didn't call me for that. He called me to tell me that the judgment had leaked. He testified before the NJC. I did my own. The NJC panel, the chairman of which was to fix the appeal for hearing, but failed to fix it for hearing until I came in. Said that the panel, that the party, and that uh, there was no, there was no leakage. And that he, Kasinadu, said that the, no, the, uh, the, the information about the case was derived from the petition written against me. There was no allegation of, uh, of leakage in the petition. So they found it. Then who lied? If you reject his defense and you have nothing to say against my defense, is it not that in the absence of any evidence to the contrary, you should accept my own? Never did they, they said that my own was unfounded. <laughs> did I go there for tea party? Or did they find me nothing about when they called me? So we just leave everything to God Almighty. So is the arbiter, is the final arbiter. But I assure you all that in spite of all what happened, I am a very happy man. I'm a very happy man. And I do not, not for a moment, have I regretted what I did. Not for a moment. I'm very happy for what I did. And I'm very proud of what I did. I thank God Almighty and I thank all of you for coming here. Thank you. Justice Ayah Salami was suspended by the National Judicial Council in August 2001 for refusing to apologize to the council and the former Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Aloysius Katsina Alu, after a face-off between both men. Well, it's on that note, we round off this week's episode of the program. If you missed any part of it, you can watch again by logging into youtube.com forward slash channels web. Please send in any comments via email or Facebook. And of course, follow me on Twitter. I'm Shalashi Thank you for watching.